Hi everybody, welcome to our first video on partial fractions. This is a technique you could have learned in an algebra class, but we're going to find that when studying antiderivatives, this is going to have a lot of applicability. Let's see an example. Say I wanted to find an antiderivative for 4 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. None of the techniques we've studied so far are going to be of much use here, but we do make an observation. I can factor x squared plus 2x minus 3 as x plus 3 times x minus 1. Okay, great. So I just split the fraction up, integrate it term by term, right? Wrong. You cannot break a fraction up or an integral up into a product and then integrate term by term. Integral of a product is not the product of the integrals. So we need another way. Okay. Here's the really clever trick. Instead of breaking up this fraction as a product, we're going to break it up as a sum because we know we can integrate a sum term by term. Is that legal? Let's see how it is. Say I wanted to break up 4 over x plus 3 times x minus 1 as a fraction plus another fraction where the first fraction is over x plus 3 and the second one is over x plus 1. Now, I need to put something in the numerator. I don't know what they're going to be, but we're really lucky. There's a really cool theorem that says I can find constants A and B that make this equality true. And furthermore, if I find those constants A and B doing it right, I'm going to get the same answer as if you find those constants A and B doing it correct, of course. All right, well, let's see how you actually get this A and B. So what I'm going to do first is multiply by x plus 3 times x minus 1. So when I multiply that on the left, well, it'll just kill the denominator, and I'm left with a 4. So I have 4 equals, and now on the right, well, I'll get a over x plus 3 times, okay, this denominator, x plus 3 times x minus 1. Of course, I also get this second term, so plus b over x minus 1 times x plus 3 times x minus 1. Now the cool thing, you see here I have an x plus 3 in the numerator and an x plus 3 in the denominator, those cancel. And so I'm left with a times x minus 1. And then on this second sum end, the x minus 1's are going to cancel. And so I'm left with b times x plus 3. Okay. I'm going to go one step further now in distributing these. And I'm going to combine like terms as I go. I find this a little bit more efficient. So let's take a look and see how many x's I'm going to get. So here I get ax's, and here I get bx's. So in total, I have a plus bx's. So a plus bx's. Okay, how many constants do I get? Well, I get a times negative 1, so that's going to be negative a and b times 3, or 3b. Three okay, so now on the right side I have a polynomial. a plus b times x plus some number. On the left side I have a polynomial. It's a very simple one, it's just the polynomial 4, but it's a polynomial nonetheless. And there's a rule about polynomials. If I have two of them and they're equal to each other, their coefficients have to match. So what do I mean by the coefficients? I mean, well, the constant term here is 4, so the constant term here has to be 4. Let's write that down. 4 equals negative a plus 3b. And, well, what's the, con the coefficient of x? Here it's a plus b. And over here, well, there is no x. What do I do? Well, I could write this as, well, 0 x's. So the coefficient of x is 0, the coefficient here of x is a plus b, and so those must equal each other. So 0 equals a plus b. Okay, so this gives me a system of two equations with two unknowns, and I'd like to solve this system. Okay, this is not going to be so bad here. I'm going to add these together. Why am I adding? Because I notice I have negative a and positive a. If I add those together, the a's go away. So adding... I get 4 plus 0 is 4, negative a plus a is 0, and 3b plus b is 4b. And so 4 times b is 4, so b has to be 1. 
OK, once I know b is 1, and I know that a and b add up to 0, a has to be negative 1. And so that tells me that actually what I could do is go back and rewrite my fractions where a is negative 1, so negative 1 over x plus 3, and b is positive 1, so plus 1 over x minus 1. And so now if I want to compute this antiderivative, instead of computing it of this fairly complicated function, I can break this up and integrate each of these piece by piece. Okay, now before we do that, let's do a little cutaway and take a look at a more general version of this. Okay, we're going to use these a lot doing partial fractions. All right, so before we move on to solve our problem, we're going to find an antiderivative of a function that's going to show up a lot when we handle functions using partial fractions. So the function we're looking at is 1 over ax plus b. Right? We're very often going to be factoring our uh, quadratics or cubics or whatever into linear factors, and those are the linear factors right there. So we are going to need to know this, and instead of working it out every single time, let's solve this problem once and for all. So if I'm going to find an antiderivative, 1 over ax plus b, I'm going to do a substitution. So we're going to do a substitution of u equals ax plus b, so that du is equal to a dx. Okay, so if we do this substitution, now let's see what happens. Uh, first, dx, what is that going to get replaced by? Well, if du equals a dx, then dx is equal to du over a. So I can replace dx by du over a. And then ax plus b, well, that just turns into u. Okay. I'm going to pull this 1 over a outside of the integral. Don't want to deal with that. So 1 over a integral of du over u. And this is a, an elementary antiderivative here. Uh, 1 over u has antiderivative ln of the absolute value of u. So I have 1 over a ln the absolute value of u. But u, remember, is ax plus b. Okay, so any time we see integral 1 over ax plus b, we know immediately it's going to be 1 over a, so a is this coefficient of x, times the natural log of the ax plus b in absolute values. Now there's a special case, which we're going to well, see enough that it's worth pointing out. If there's no a, that is if the a is 1, well, this actually becomes much, much easier. It's just the natural log of the absolute value of x plus b. Okay, P plus, of course, our constants of integration. But you'll notice the 1 over a just becomes 1 over 1. The ax is still just x. Okay, so this is going to be reasonably uh, uh, ubiquitous that we're going to want to, uh, to know that one too. Okay, but this is the general form. Okay, so now we'll go back to solving our example. Okay, so with that behind us, we now go back to our example. We found a partial fraction decomposition. And now to find the antiderivatives, we use what we just learned. We do these term by term. First, a well, negative 1. I can pull that out. I really have 1 over x plus 3. So negative 1 times antiderivative of 1 over x plus 3. Oh, that's great. There's just a constant 1 here. Natural log absolute value of x plus 3. And the second one, even easier, there's no negative sign to worry about. Still, no coefficient on the x. I get plus the natural log of x minus 1. And of course, we can add our constant of integration. So this is going to be a really, really slick method of handling some fairly gnarly looking uh, antiderivatives.